If you're a B2B business, a B2B tech company, or a B2B marketer, you're in the right place. Coming to you from Studio 26, this is the Interesting B2B Marketers Podcast. Bringing you interesting contemporary takes, industry tips, guest interviews, and true stories from B2B marketers in the trenches. Now, here's your host, Steve Goldhaber. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Studio 26. This is Steve, your host of Interesting B2B Marketers. I'm excited today because we are joined by Scott Vaughn. Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. All right, my pleasure. So listeners know we always jump right into the cases, but before we do that, give us a quick 60-second intro about who you are. Well, I'm a marketing geek, marketer who spent about 10 years of their career in sales, carrying a bag or leading a team of field salespeople, regional, national, and global. And I think that experience being a marketing and salesperson over my career uh, really helped shape how I think about. And one of my main focus at this point in my career is about bringing it all together into a go-to-market strategy and how to activate that across the organization. Primarily, my my time has been spent in the technology markets, broadly speaking, IT, cloud, the traditional cybersecurity, the traditionals, but also more broadly, fintech, healthcare tech, et cetera. And I would say that the thing that has helped shape me is I work a lot in market versus behind the desk. And you'll I hopefully in some of the case studies that we, as we try to figure out stuff, that's been one of my things I've learned to do to really learn the markets and study and, and know the audience, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the things that I now will leave in that are so critical. Yep. All right. Awesome. So we're going to jump into the case. The first one has to do with sales and marketing alignment problems, which of course, it's nothing new. We will always continue to talk <laughs> about sales and marketing alignment issues, but go ahead and take away the first case. Well, the first case really is around, of all things, a government technology company that is a mix of services and software. And these very advanced work that they're doing, by the way, but right away you hear that word and it's very typical. You go into the executive team and they say, oh, gosh, if we could just get sales and marketing aligned, we could fix this. And I've heard that in in all my companies I've worked for. And now the last 18 months, I, I have advisory and consulting, a hands-on one. And almost every time there's a piece of it, but that's not the core underlying issue. In this case, it was really everything got pushed out to the field. And in my experience, and certainly in this case, go to market needs to be an organizational thing. It needs to be through product and operations and finance and end sales and marketing and in the software world in customer success where they're touching the customers every day and the big deal is renewal, upsell, cross-sell and your recurring revenue and subscription model. And so you diagnose it quickly. If we could just get those darn salespeople to X, if marketing could just create more leads or more demand, we, we pipeline, we'd be fine. And typically you've got to break that down and understand what are the mechanics. And, and I don't say start from scratch, but really rethink your emotions of how to go to market. Oh. Yeah, I wonder, I want to get your thoughts on this because sales and marketing alignment, you know, it's a rich area to be in because there's endless need for it. And why, what do we think the root cause of this is? Is it a, is it a structural issue where to typically the marketers report into the CEO, the salespeople report into the CEO, then there's all this gray area around, well, what's sales enablement, what's brand building? I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on like, what's, what's consistently driving that? Yeah. Why, why do you start with the easy questions? <laughs> Well, it's just a one word answer. So, That's all I, I'm, I'm wondering. Yeah, well, you know, if it was only that simple, I think there's a few things, though, to, to delve into there. One is sales and marketing, when everything's going great, they're aligned. And that's because they're aligned around a customer or they've got the tailwind of a market that's, that's exploding. And, and so it's easier to, to do that. But the problem is sales and marketing have different functions and roles. Those need to be integrated, not just aligned. But today, especially in, in the software world we're talking about, where so many companies are software with services, even the most mundane companies have software working in the background to either automate or drive some kind of engagement with the market. So today that becomes really, really important that you bring in the other functions. If your product, for example, is it's... Look at all the features the product has, but it's not aligned with the market or the platform or the services you're offered. 
or they're not packaged right, yeah. that's a product alignment to the market issue, not just sales and marketing. And so if you just keep putting stuff out to sales and marketing, one, they're just not naturally, they have to do different, play different roles. And two, the whole organization has to be able to prepare get constantly and be part of that process. And I can break that down specifically. So for example, you know, you have a product, they go build the stuff, develop it and bring it to market. That's, that's been forever the case, no matter what segment you're in. But in this case, you look at stuff like product-led growth. The product, uh, for example, is designed from the get-go to be self-serve. Product's designed for the customer to be providing direct input. And then there's a sales assisted motion where marketing is bringing people to the conversation to say, try this solution or try a piece of the product and then put them in a motion to build their relationship and build their engagement with a broader set of solutions over time. So very different go-to-market models and motions. But by the way, that applies so much in today's market, the way companies buy, which is the second thing, Steve. The sales and marketing alignment thing is when you go, and especially I'm in business to business, when you go into that world, customers want to be primarily self-serve, you know, 80 something percent of the engagement is already done before a sales rep gets truly involved and brought into the process by the customer and by the buying committee, which is getting bigger and bigger and more complex because typically the decisions they're making in many cases, there's more on the line for the customer. So there's customer indecision, there's more people involved. And that means that you have to really think through that process ahead of time. You can't just develop it all and have a couple of sales and marketing input and then take yep. it to market. It needs to be a continuous, connected, integrated process. And I'm not throwing those words around lightly. It's way more than a line. Yep. My last point is sales and marketing still need to be in lockstep, in unison. So you may have a sales and marketing problem, but it's so often misdiagnosed as in, in the case that we're talking about here. And once you started to illuminate that, Steve, it was amazing to see. And the way you can illuminate it is you bring product and operations people into those meetings and discussions when you're doing your, your go-to-market, your ideal customer profile, your value propositions of the different pieces of your solutions. You're identifying not just the pains of your customer, but you're drilling into the jobs to be done, how they work. And all of a sudden you're going, whoa, 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 we've got to, we don't have all the pieces. We either need a partner, we need to acquire something, yeah. or we need to build something different to be able to deliver against that. And now all of a sudden you're in more of a symbiotic flow and you want to keep that flow. So that's how you really yeah. begin to drive the natural scale and growth. Yeah, that's interesting. So if, I, if I'm recapping kind of what you're saying is when we hear sales and marketing alignment issues, that's that's just a symptom. The deeper problem is your go-to-market. Like it is when the software was yes. built, are we going after verticals, different approaches, things like that. So that that's very interesting. I've, I haven't gotten there before yet. and But it makes sense that, that it's a deeper issue, especially when, you know, I imagine a lot of the technology out there, it's a technical founder who is great yes. at building something and then, hey, I think I've built something. Can someone sell this? And that's where the where it all plays you out. You got it exactly right with great intentions or companies have acquired multiple companies. And, you know, so when it gets to market, the salesperson kind of gets into a stop me when you like something motion because the pieces aren't fully integrated or you expect your sales team to be completely versed on, well, if they say this, do that. I mean, there's certain products and markets that's the case. It's high, high, high level strategic selling, big ticket prices. But in many cases, there's no way you can, can prepare an entire yep. sales force to do that. Or that now you're asking marketing with this much budget to go out in segments so tightly that they have to be so prescriptive yep. on getting this value proposition of this part of the product to that person at the right time. That's just not realistic, no matter how data-driven or how good the marketing team is. Yep. So that's where you step back and get the, the whole company in alignment in revolving and focused around a, a strategy or a couple of different strategies and put the right motions where motions mean you've got energy going into the market, got the right markets defined, you've got the right solutions or partnerships, you got you have the right messaging. And, and what happens, Steve, so often, and this is going to be in all the cases I talk about, oh, let's get marketing to do the the messaging and the value. We'll do a workshop offsite. No, <laughs> no, you need core leadership at those finance, ops, products functions to be pulled into this process along the way and agree upon what the outcomes to be. That's where integration happens. It starts there. 
And it's painful at first. I'm in this case of the case I'm talking about, the product and operations people are looking around like, are those people in the same company? I could see their faces. But once they start to define exactly how the solution works and how it was built or what it was designed to do, they're seriously taking notes about gaps, product prioritization. But they're also saying, well, well, let's not emphasize that then. Let's focus on this. And now all of a sudden you've got product experts or and market experts and operational experts saying, well, why don't we just add on a service to that? Uh, oh, we can do that. And then all you get this whole dynamic that's going on in the room. And now all of a sudden your go-to-market materials look different. Mm-hmm. Your website value propositions, how you tell your story in your decks and your narrative, yeah. you enter from different points. It's quite amazing when you you recalibrate. And that's why I use go to market and what I, that's the playbook I, I run over and over again, and especially in these markets that are so dynamic. Yeah. When I've gotten clients or, you know, when I worked at corporate companies, it always got so much easier to do the marketing when you had that alignment, because all of a sudden the marketing wasn't just about the company, it's about the audience. And that's where you could have the yes. most creativity because really the role of marketing if done right, is for the customer to say, man, that's me. They are speaking to me. They get me. And then once you've earned that trust, then you can go in and have the conversation around features, functionality, how to buy the thing. But that's when marketing to me is most enjoyable, when it's not generic product focus. It's all about you're speaking to the customer. So easy to say, but it's so difficult. In this case, it's there's so much about the what versus you got to market the problem. As much as, you know, you don't, there's obviously where you need to represent your company and bring it to life. And today, even more because of sustainability and diversity and inclusion, it's a powerful uh, story and so authentic to bring your company mission and values into it. But that's not the lead story. That's the supporting character in the, in the play, so to speak. You, you really want to make the villain the problem, the challenge yep. and, and market that of how to knock it back, knock it down, overcome it. And and that's, you know, another conversation and another podcast, but it's that idea if you get the, if you do the work right in the company, those things come out and they're so obvious and you get the company behind the problem and then you're able to articulate your value. And it's not just today about being unique or differentiated. That's not what's going to help you stand out. That's yep. important, but so much of that exercise when you did the traditional uh, you know, marketing ideal customer profile and your audience and your value prop was how are we different? Customer doesn't care necessarily how you're different. You have to answer some of that, but they care about can you solve my problem in a unique way, not as you're your mousetrap different. And they feel it from the entirety of the company and everything you put behind it, the way you communicate, how you do outreach, how that message is delivered, how the company delivers during their their engagement before they become a customer, after they become a customer. And that's the whole idea of having a, you know, a more holistic customer experience. That takes a company, that takes a company being organized and thoughtful about their go-to-market strategy. Yeah. Tell us more about this company that you're working with. Like how have they evolved their thinking on their, on their sales and marketing alignment challenge? Well, yeah, well, first of all, they realize now like, oh, okay, boy, do we have a lot of experts? Because they only were we only tapped into them when we, you know, when they needed something yeah. at the point of sale or to, you know, at a customer, and they realized quickly, wow, these people, well, they're handling the customer's stuff. In this case, they're all of their uh, records and software and everything, so they know what they're talking about. And how do we unlock that power more? So these light bulbs start going off that. We have these incredibly knowledgeable people that work every day on customer needs and problems, but we only think about them when, you know, when we need something or in, in, you know, at the point where when we have those product input meetings and then they go away. So this becomes a consistent element. This is exactly the case at uh, the organization that I'm talking about and to watch the light bulbs go off and to see that they're experiencing it in sales and marketing now. It's like, wow, okay, this is more than a value proposition exercise or, you know, that you kind of get, you call on those people when you need the details of the information. They actually have a pretty good perspective. And you also gain empathy the other way where the product operations finance people now understand like, okay, whoa, that's a, they got to bring the customer a long way. I see why now our sales cycle is probably six to nine months and not just three. And when we're in those QBR, quarterly business review meetings, 
problems. Now I'm going to have more empathy and understanding and maybe bring some ideas to bring more resources to the fight, to the battle, so to speak. Yeah, we need more empathy in, in those meetings, especially from the finance people. The finance people are like, look, it was <laughs> they have some great ideas. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they, especially today, because they understand all the mechanics of the numbers today and the new business models, you know, whether it's subscription or ARR and or uh, especially when you're trying to do a lot of renewals. So you've got you know, net dollar retention and net yep. logo retention and customer acquisition costs, lifetime value. Finance can speak that language and help you and understand that, but they have to understand the whole picture. Yeah. All right, cool. Let's jump into to case number two, which is all about helping someone move from a, a startup environment and, and helping them scale fast. Yeah, so this was one of my uh, favorite chores and things to do. And I work for a lot of enterprises and still do with enterprises. But this is a case where you come to market and a lot of the younger companies, and when I say startup, I, you could be anywhere from a million to 10, 15, even 20 million, but you're still kind of working around your market problem you know, fit and is there a product market fit? And, you know, our first hundred customers were great, but I need to scale this thing now. Is it a real company that's beyond the product? And in this case, it's, it was uh, software as well, but in specific markets, segmentation. And, you know, the first thing that the CEO or the executive team wants to do, well, when I worked at Salesforce, <laughs> right? So you can't play that playbook. Uh, you are coming in with a new kind of solution. In most cases, you might have the greatest solution ever that's going to change the world. In most cases, you have to find the problems that you're solving, but you have to go down. And I'm going to go old school with Jeffrey Moore in Crossing the Chasm said, you need to find a bowling lane. And in this case, the, the bowling lane was, let's not go out and try to generate a ton of leads in every market and that's stop you when you like something and hope something sticks. But rather, let's drill in that go to market on a set of maybe a couple of verticals or segment the market by the type of buyer that we have. In this case, it was they were the most advanced buyers. And to reach those, they typically have been there, done that, seen that. So you have to go what I call kiss the ring. You have to bring the market to them and make them part of the solution. So once you get those people won over, then you can unlock a lot of the rest of the market because they have voices, they have the brand, either personally or from their company. And if they like it, now they're going to talk about there's a change going on. So in this case, when we started and I joined as CMO, it was, okay, we are going to, I need you to build a demand generation and lead engine. And I took a deep breath and I said, actually, we're going to wait about six to nine months. We're going to be building that in the background. But what we're going to do is we're going to find, in this case, it was 47. I'm being very specific if you can't tell the therapy that's happening, Steve, that you're <laughs> giving right. me. 47 influencers who are either buyers, customers, maybe people like yourself who have a voice that people follow that are a believer and known in this segment for something of being, of understanding, of being breakthrough, of being able to articulate. And we worked those 47 people for six months. Yeah. And it started with, in our go-to-market, we had a sketch in what we thought it would be. We would bring that to them and say, we think that there's a a change going on. Here's what we're seeing. Can you help us? Can you define it? And not like, can you help us? But do you want to be part of this? And they'd be up on the whiteboard or virtually sending us stuff. Well, no, yeah. it looks more like this. And before they're part of the, the challenge. And then you still are in market using social, using high value educational content. And if you do a webinar, it's not about your product and how to use it. It's more about the problem and yep. and really pouring salt on it. And then this becomes the way then that I've got to see what these guys are up to. I'm seeing them everywhere and I'm, I see they brought in a lot of people and a lot of high profile customers that are talking about a change. So we want to make them part of the movement. And that segmentation and that ability to win those, by the way, they typically spend more faster because they're more confident if, if your solution works. And in this case, this is exactly what happened. We built in and segmented and layered there, and then we would expand out to the next segment, the next segment. We'd even hire the right sales team to focus in segmentation. But you had to slow down to hurry up, yeah. even in this case. I, you know, I'm going to jump in on the 47. Uh -oh. here's, why, here's why I really like that. And I'll, I'll pull from my own experience. So this is when I used to work for a big company. We had the IC. CP, right? It was a beautiful five, six slides in PowerPoint talking about the profile. And I got really frustrated with that because it was so specific, yet they didn't have names. So my question was, can we just start using these people's names? 
Like, why don't we go spend a week? And there was only like 800, 900 of these people because they were, you know, they're mostly like C-suite buyers at bigger companies. I said, let's just do the research and get the list so we actually know. So that's why I really like the specificity around here are the people that we're going to reach out to for influencing is because so often we marketers hide behind this profile that, yes. that you just are like, well, yeah, I get the profile. It helps me create marketing materials. It helps the creative team, but just use the people's names. And and then if you really wanted to get sophisticated, you know, do some email matching and some, you know, some list depends so that you can target just those people. And it was well, still, today, you know, there's so much data, Steve, to your point, you can yeah. profile off an actual person and understand everything from their LinkedIn profile to their presence. Exactly that. That's exactly what you do. They, they're real people with real challenges. And by the way, they're trying to solve the next challenges. A big part of the market still looking around going, well, uh, no, well, we've got this. We're good. Yeah. Now, I should have said up front, this case, we were changing the way to approach or to solve a problem. So it was a change management had to be part of that go-to-market as well. It wasn't radical change, but it was, yeah. they had to kind of, they were thinking like this, marketing automation, they needed to think like this and they needed to open up the aperture a little bit to do that. Yeah. I think one thing I've seen too, get in the way of the getting to real people is most of the salespeople are typically not aligned by their relationships of who they know. It, it's by vertical or territory. So you would never- Patch. Yeah, like you'd never be in this environment where it's like, well, I've got a really good relationship with that CTO, but you know, they're not in my territory. Now, she, of course, you should be helping a fellow rep to be like, hey, if you want, I can, I can get an intro and help work that. But it, it's almost like that'd be a really interesting sales model is relationship based, like who owns. Well, that's how you hire in the beginning. When you have a young company, you hire based on a relationships yes. for a part of it. The challenge becomes when you try to replicate it to scale it, and then you hire people. And if you're not a domain expert when in a change movement at the point of the field, it's very hard to be a good salesperson because the treat you have to know what you're talking about. So this is in your go-to-market model. Yeah. In those earlier days, you're building people who have relationships with those influencers or with that type of professional where they can, I'll say, lean on a bit what they love communicating and selling and making the customer part of the solution to define it. They're comfortable in that world. Yep. What happens then, you get all your mojo and you try to replicate that. So you go hire maybe a really good, let's say an enterprise salesperson, but they're not a domain expert. So it falls down. So that's the problem when you go to that scale up stage. And especially in this last phase of the era of the market where investors say, well, if you hire 10 more salespeople, that's 20 more million in ARR. And that was a formula. Well, the nuances of the formula that go to market are so intricate because that next, that's where you have to be able to repeat and do domain expertise transfer to a new set of salespeople in this change movement era and that you have to time it right. It's not just a formula on a spreadsheet that, you know, some unicorn followed that yep. you, you can do. It's, it's much more prescriptive. Yeah. What are some of the other challenges for this company as they were scaling up? Well, first time CEO. So uh, did a fabulous job of learning and immersing and being on the front line. I mean, but that has some of its own challenges in terms of there's all new stuff being implemented and maybe they have an idea. And it's not always a challenge, but it's, it's one of the realities. The second thing is the company had moved from a previous model. So there was baggage. And by the way, that baggage wasn't so much baggage. It was a cash cow to fund this next element and navigating those two pieces and what we did there is we separated the go-to-market motions. We actually put a team on and even a product team focused on maintaining that cash cow solution while we're building out this new yep. element. So it wasn't just a pure startup, yep. and it, which by the way, that's not atypical because a, co a founder or a team may start something and all of a sudden step into something like, oh my gosh, we're right at the right time in the market, but we spent three years building this and it's not quite aligned. So there's ways to navigate go to market. By the way, reason number 1032 of why to align product, operations, finance, sales, and marketing, because especially in those younger companies, you may have the right concept, but it may take some time to develop the right solution set and time the market a bit. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. I like both of those case studies. I mean, I, it really, of all the time I spent in marketing, I've lived in the bubble of marketing and sales and marketing. And, you, and this has been a really good conversation of really getting under 
meet those issues, which are not sales and marketing at all. They're just reflected in in those teams kind of going to market. We're going to jump over now into Q&A. So tell us about your first gig in marketing. What were you doing? Lucky, I'll tell you that. I had done a, a paid internship my senior year of college, just reflecting now. This is like therapy. I'll send you the bill. Um, Don't worry about it. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> no, so you, so I did it actually for a city government of all things, but it was a incredible learning experience because it was hands-on putting together things like newsletters and slideshows and trying to bring the community and what the city was doing. It was fabulous. So of course, when I took my first job, it was in tech. I knew nothing about tech and I fell into it and it was 21 people. But I really liked the director of marketing who was super smart, very focused, took a chance. And I was actually a leader of a couple of people and it was in marketing communications. At that time, it wasn't about demand and revenue as much about, you know, value propositions and, and brochures and logos and brand identity and trade shows and PR and that type of activity. The company went from 20 to 450 people in three and a half years. And my eye would go, well, this is how it works, right? And then the company got acquired. So I got, you know, a little check, nothing big, but this is really cool. This is going to be my career. Nothing but blue sky and upward. Well, quickly you get into the reality of that was a, incredibly unique time, right product at the right time with the right team. And you start to appreciate those moments when you know you have something special. And I've had, I think, three times in my career when you get that feeling. And I think every, anybody listening will go, yeah, I remember that or I'm looking for that. And, and that's when everything clicked. So I think there's a lot of luck in it of being the right place at the right time. But I was a grinder in that team and I had to learn everything because I worked for someone who was a mentor and gave me the keys with some tough love, with some guardrails. But I became a product marketer. I didn't know anything, Steve, about that. But because I was confident and worked hard and I learned all about product and before long, I was in the field with, you know, after about a year, year and a half, I was in the field with salespeople being a voice. And that light bulb went off for me that you have to become a domain expert in your industry. If you are in market or in my world, I call it go to market. You have to really understand not just the audience. And as you said, those faceless names for profiles and kind of that agency at times mentality, you really in a service bureau to sales, your customer is your customer, not sales is your customer. Sales is your partner. Your product team's your partner. And I, th I think that was shaped so, so, so much at that, that first gig that I actually went into sales in my next job yeah. uh, because I was in the field so much. And I felt like if I knew sales, I'd be a better marketer, which is what I love to do. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You, you described the, one of your first jobs where everything was going right. They sold the company. It's amazing at when a company is doing well and growing. Everyone just seems to have fun. And I've been in those environments before where like literally you, you could do an average job of marketing and you're still making a ton of money and everyone views marketing as like, wow, this is, you guys are doing great. And then I've been in other slower growth industries where just by the structure of the industry and the health of the yes. company, you could be doing amazing things, but it just, the company wasn't growing and healthy. So therefore that mood just kind of always, it was like a cloud. And it's amazing how, so well said. how that environment really just dictates the day-to-day -day happiness and personal growth of a lot of, of marketing and salespeople. Well, Steve, here's the philosophy, right? I, I want to work with people I enjoy, I like, it share similar values. The mission today, it's even more important. But don't be confused. This is a conversation I have all the time with other marketers. It is a lot better to have where tailwinds behind your market, where marketing can actually have an impact that you can shape and do something. Pushing a rock uphill all day with people you like, you could do that for a while. <laughs> yeah. But after a while, you it's really hard to have impact and vice versa. You could be a skyrocket ship but every day it's brutal because the environment or yep. the culture or the people that you work with are just not of like minds or the environment that's been created. Uh, we've all been there. We're all visualizing, I'm sure, as we listen here. But that's where, and from a career sp perspective, you're trying to calibrate that as best as you best you can. Yep. All right. A couple more questions here. Let's say next week comes along and you've got nothing on your calendar, right? You get to determine your ideal week. What are the, what are the things that you love to do? I love the ideation phase. So for me, one of the things I like about this gig that you get to work with five or six different companies or three or four different companies, and you actually have time to think. And when I think of do that, I think about don't fall off your chair programs because sometimes you're so immersed in the mechanics 
of the market and building the strategy, the activation really is a lot of the reason people get into marketing. And if you can step back, the idea is that you can go out because you've been in market and talking to real customers or real profiles of people, not fictitious and taking research and building you know, mechanical models. I think that's really what I enjoy doing is that ideation with a team of creating um, those programs and campaigns with themes of problems to solve and, and ways to creatively do that. I think it's a lost art. Uh, we're in the era right now, and I was a publisher of a big IT, you know, the biggest in the universe for about a three-year period where you could meet with anybody you wanted because it, uh, the brand had that kind of power and clout, but you had to know your markets and you had to be able to articulate. Well, I translate that today to content. And right at the, when we have chat, GPT, and AI, right, it's easy, I did a session yesterday where I just plugged in a bunch of stuff and it's pretty damn good. And the idea though here is it's this much differentiation often. So you can use that as a base, but that today I think of AI and chat GPT as a tool and it's a great foundation, but you're looking for that breakthrough piece. You're looking for that, that thing that connects that's where you connect uniquely with people to be able to build the right kind of connected content that today we can apply against the journey. Yeah. So uh, another one of my areas is don't create content for content's sake or to check the box, but actually, you know, a little less with more impact. That's yep. the way I always look at it. And that's tied back to your, your kind of program themes and your go-to-market strategy. That's that whole activation, Steve, which yep. would be a, a probably a different podcast and conversation. Uh, if you can't tell, I get juiced when we get to that phase because get the other part right. Now you can be truly creative and interesting and provocative, and that's the good stuff. All right, now, so now I'm going to ask the opposite of the question, which I just asked was, there's, you know, five meetings on your calendar next week, and, and you just want to decline them all. What are the things that you are just like, maybe not the type of meeting, but like, what's the situation where you don't enjoy being in? You know, you deal with a lot of change management, I'm sure. What are some scenarios where you're just like, hey, I'll, I'll stick it out, I can roll up my sleeves, but these types of things I know not to pursue? I don't like intellectual exercises. So a lot of times, well, we're going to review X. We're going to review the product roadmap. I don't, I love reviewing product roadmaps, but it's, it's clearly disguised or misunderstood as an intellectual exercise. It's not being done to move something forward. And that to me is those types of meetings. And we all know them when you walk in, it's like, okay, we, we went over this. What's the real thing that we're trying to solve here? And that to me is what I ask, especially when I'm in the role of facilitator or owning, what is it that we're trying to get to or get out of this session? Why are we doing this? Yeah. What does it need to look like when we're done? And those meetings, and I use product review if you can't tell, because that was last <laughs> week. Like, that's yeah. not our problem. Yeah. Our problem is how do we find and develop the right so package, the right solution set out of what we have to bring to market? That should have been the meeting. Um, that's one. The other one is when you go, you see the meetings that, that are continuous, that are actually going back in their passive aggressive. They're trying to get you to review what you've done or trying to get somebody on board to an idea. Uh, and that doesn't happen in a meeting necessarily. It really needs to happen. That's part of change management. You need to find your advocates and then you need to go show and prove and then bring that into the bigger group and keep building from there. But the passive aggressive trying to get somebody on board to something, I know it's reality and not naive. But those kind of meetings, and I've had a few over the last three weeks, they're just never healthy. That's a sign that you're not moving forward. Yep. It's a sign that you're standing still or slipping back. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I feel like culture really drives so many of the good and the bad meetings we have. And in that example you just talked about, I, I can relate to that in spending 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, whatever it may be, where the, the core issue isn't even discussed, right? Like, there's always something going That's behind it. the scenes and it's almost like if you could have just opened up with the meeting to saying, look, I'm going to have a brutally honest conversation. Here's, yes. here's what I'm seeing. Is this accurate? Do we believe in it? Should we fix it? But, but to your point, it, it becomes presented in very much like a business case academic perspective, which yes. you don't know when those conversations start or stop. They, they're just, they, they're ongoing. Yeah. And have we identified, do we know what the challenge or opportunity or 
do we know where we are in the in our journey in in, in against our goals? And I don't when I'm saying that around the meeting concept, that's I think that comes a lot, Steve, with maturity. But in, if the culture doesn't allow for that, or you're stuck there, that's when you start slowing down. When the mission is to accelerate, and that's when you start to that's when you really feel that that you're stuck. And sometimes you you need a new view. I always go into market when you need a new view and bring people with me. Let's go get underneath the hood and figure out what's going on out there, including, you know, even your CEO or executives or leaders. Let's go, let's go test this. Let's go throw it up against the wall and see, and let's try to break down what the real issue is. And when I say go and market, it may be by Zoom today. It, yep. It's not always be great to be face to face, but the concept of let's go to the truth tellers and see how it works. Yep. All right, final question. A lot of the folks who listen to the podcast are our senior marketers who are figuring out how to navigate this whole go-to-market thing. For those people who've already, you know, they're already at established companies, what's the one thing that they could start thinking about or doing tomorrow to kind of say, all right, maybe I should go on this journey to, to recalibrate everything? Okay, titles don't mean anything, but there's a group that I kind of grew up in marketing with and still rely on. Uh, my tribe, so to speak, this concept of chief market officer. So I dropped my ing. I love marketing. I love all the tradi- programs, campaigns, all that stuff. I love that's activation. I just kind of recalibrate my role as chief market officer. I represent the market. I represent our customer opportunity and I represent the pain. And that orientation reprioritizes a lot of things. And people start to look at you differently in meetings. They start to think, oh, okay, you're not the, the marketing person. And you know what I mean when I say that. Where's my leads? Or how come the t-shirts don't do this? And I'm being facetious and dramatic for a purpose here. But when you're known as the market person who understands the mechanics, the drivers, the opportunities in the market, and you speak that language across the organization, when you have an opportunity to get on stage to represent your company, big or small, you're that ability. That's the one thing I would say, that orientation that I see when the light bulb goes off and your opportunity and role changes. If you stick in the marketing chair, in most companies, your executive peers or other leaders are going to put their own definition of marketing on you, their definition. And by the way, that's mixed depending on who you talk about because they have a perception of what marketing does. And today, marketing's been drug, you know, really down through the mud. It's really four or five jobs today, especially as sales has been disintermediate and doesn't have the same kind of access to prospects and customers that it did, as we talked about earlier, because of the buying process. Now marketing's carrying a sales burden. Mm-hmm. Marketing's carry a market burden. The marketing's carrying a customer experience burden. Oh, by the way, you still have to build that killer um, demand or revenue engine. And oh, by the way, the brand identity look and feel, we need to increase that. Yeah, the list just keeps going on and you can't win that game. And that's why you see a lot of the CMO or heads of marketing in that couple year range of of a job tenure because of that. It's don't play that game. Uh, You're you're set up to lose. I like that. Good advice. Take off the ING. It does. It's a small thing that makes you be perceived by others as just someone who can have a bigger impact. So great advice there. Yeah. And it's not just changing the title, of course. It's living, walking yep. the walk and all that. But yes, that that that's the that's the focus. Yep. Awesome. Well, Scott, I want to thank you for joining us on interesting B2B marketers today. I uh, really enjoyed the conversation. And thank you to all the listeners and viewers. If you haven't already, make sure that you like and subscribe. You can listen to us, you can watch us, and sometimes you can read about us too. So we we push this content out through our own company and in personal LinkedIn channels. So be on the lookout for that. And Scott, once again, thanks for joining us. Love what you're doing, Steve. Thanks for having me. All right, take care. Thanks for tuning in to the interesting B2B Marketers podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you heard this podcast so you never miss an episode. If you found value in today's episode, please help grow the podcast by sharing with others and leaving a review. We'll see you next time.